All right, so uh, welcome along to the Coaching Corner uh, this Thursday. It's good to see you all and good to catch up as well. Um, again, I'd just like to uh, formally acknowledge the support of Philips and already there we go um i'd like to acknowledge the support of philip so i just want to pop it out there too uh if you have questions for next week please send them on in either on twitter at zidu now or at my personal account at i underscore c underscore sound or you can email me directly and my email is just on the bottom there so again i've been playing with the lumify this week to get some pictures but i'll show you more later in the uh, session so our questions this week, uh, how do you find the ovaries on a transabdominal exam? How do I assess for ovarian torsion? And uh, Kean's Perla, the idiot's guide to spectral Doppler. So we're going to start with how to find the ovaries. Uh, I'll start with a couple of technical tips and then uh, move on to the how to. Ovaries are elusive and particularly difficult on transabdominal scanning. I personally think it's about 70 to 100 cases uh, where you're consciously looking and really trying to find the ovaries before you start to get any confidence or any degree of competence. Some you're just not gonna find, but differentiating between the, I can't find an ovary because it's not to be found today for reasons that are unique to the patient and I can't find an ovary because my skills just aren't quite there yet. Have I optimized the image or have I got a good window? It takes a lot of scans before you can get to um, that level where you can easily say, you know what, this is because this ovary is not to be found today. So I'm gonna start with some technical tips, as I said. So the first thing that I will mention is a bladder filling. If we're doing a trans abdominal scan of the ovaries, bladder filling is absolutely crucial. Every now and then you'll have a really slender patient where it's not going to be as vital, but um, they come along so rarely. The, the degree of bladder filling is going to um, influence how well you can see the ovaries quite remarkably. So just on uh, this image here, the, it, this bladder is about half full. And just under my little laser pointer dot there is a vague hypoechoic shape, which is as good as it gets for ovaries. Um, and then when we uh, fill the bladder, uh, you can see that the ovary just under the laser pointer here is a little bit more clearer now. And we can even see a couple of follicles on it. So that bladder filling actually does make a huge difference to how well we can see the ovaries. If we look at a transabdominal scan, so this is that same image of the ovary here, the left ovary, and you can even see sort of vague of the right just under the pointer here. And then if we look at a transvaginal image, you can see quite clearly the difference in the amount of detail that you can see. So a transabdominal scan for me when I'm doing a pelvis exam is a nice way to say hello to the patient and sort of establish a rapport with them and to introduce myself and get permission to do a transvaginal exam. Uh, and most of the time, most of the exam is a transvaginal exam. And the reason we get better pictures is that it's a high frequency probe and it's right up against the anatomy we need to look at. So those two factors sort of make much, much clearer imaging. The transabdominal scan, depending on your patient, you have to go through the abdominal wall and whatever adipose tissue may be there and then the bladder before you get to the deeper structures. So by the time the sound gets 12, 15 centimetres in, you're, you're losing the oomph you're, and you've got refraction, reverberation, all those interactions help to make the picture not so clear. So if we look at this particular picture, again on the left we have the bladder filling, it's kind of half full. I had to go a bit further afield this week to find my models. Um, and so one of the team has kindly lent me their body and these are the pictures from the Lumify. Um, we can see on this one, this vague hypochoic shadow here for the right ovary. And somewhere in here, just under the pointer is the left ovary. Now on the right-hand side of your screen, with the bladder full, you can see much clearer definition of this ovary and 
the ovary over here. Doesn't want to go. So it's important to get your um, machine settings right. So you can see left image, the depth setting, it's set way too deep. So your ovaries are really, really tiny and you're squinting. The other problem with this on a lot of the point of care machines, if your depth settings are incorrect, your focus is at the wrong zone and in the wrong place. So we're getting a, a good focal zone for the, the bowel here and, and the rectum and even a bit deeper, but it's not giving us very nice pictures of the ovaries. And all I've done on the picture on the right is to adjust the depth settings and you can see that there's a resultant improvement in the clarity of the picture. Gain is also important. So the left hand image, we've got the gain set nicely for a bladder image, but then the imaging, at least on the initial pictures as I was scanning, the imaging of the uterus and deeper structures is just too dark. And on the right, I've optimised the gain for the uterus, but now the, the gain for the bladder is not so great. So you can't, you can't get one gain setting in the pelvis that lets you see bladder and uterus very, very nicely. So we want to make sure that we have set the gain appropriately to be able to visualise the structures of the female anatomy. So if we look at how we go about scanning it or how I go about scanning it, and this is one method I'm sure um, maybe Daniela, you've got another method, but uh, you know, I tend to have this 100 ways to skin a cat, but um, I have a plan for 90% of my patients. I've got a backup plan for the other 5% and then there's 5% you're just not gonna get good imaging on. So um, as a really broad unscientific rule of thumb. So if we look at the, if we're scanning, I always start scanning in transverse. And if I just place the probe just above the symphysis, and then what we want to do is sweep up the uterus, then move over to the side of the ovary and then scan up and down, whether it is with a sweep motion or a tilting motion of your probe to scan through the adnexa. And when I'm scanning through the adnexa, I want to keep the uterus on the edge of the screen as a landmark. So what I tend to do is head north to the uterus so that I can identify the fundus and the cornea of the uterus. So I'm in particular looking for that sort of corner of the uterus where we start to see the broad ligament heading out towards the ovaries. So on the ultrasound picture, that's the area that I want to see. It kind of comes together in a triangular shape. Um, and then I'm next going to look for the broad ligament. So if we look at this anatomical model, um, you can see the broad ligament here. This first one here is the round ligament of the ovaries. And then the broad ligament is the area on the left there that I've highlighted in blue. And the broad ligament is kind of like um, the two pieces of bread of a sandwich coming together and you've got your round ligament and your fallopian tubes as the meat in the sandwich, if you like. And it sort of, it holds everything in place there. So when we're looking on the ultrasound and we cut the uterus in a transverse um, fashion, you can see from the cornea of the uterus just up here, I look for that um, funda, at the fundus looking for the cornea and then this hypoechoic area that is the broad ligament and usually at the end of the broad ligament is where I find the ovary. Now sometimes that's all in one slice but often you have to sweep up and down the adnexa and follow the broad ligament as it uh, traverses in the pelvis. And depending on your patient, how that goes. The ovaries can be quite variable in position. So, you know, some they sort of sit nice and close and tuck in behind and others sit a lot further out. So it depends a lot on your patient. And very rarely do they do the nice thing and, and present like it is in the textbooks. So if we look at that, um, that transverse kind of image and you can see the the broad ligament area here. We pop the scan on and then that's the area that we're looking for on the ultrasound. And then on the right side, it's a little bit shorter on the left side, right side of screen. So on the patient's left here, the broad ligament's a little bit shorter, but you've got that hypoechoic area just beside the fundus of the uterus and between the uterus and the ovaries. And that's what I look, as, look for as sort of like a searchlight going and pointing me towards the ovaries. So when that doesn't work, and occasionally it doesn't, you've just got to sweep up and down in 
the transverse plane to, to look and just systematically do a cross-sectional sort of a cross-sectional hatch area of each adnexa to find the ovaries. So you can see on this picture here, uterus, and then there's kind of a hypoechoic area leading out to that ovary. This uh, left ovary is tucked in right beside anyway. Now, the reason that I look for things in transverse is that, uh, pretend that green circle there is the ovary. When I've got the probe position in the transverse orientation, I've got quite a wide field of view to look. And then as I sweep up and down, I'm pretty much getting all of the adnexa from the edge of the uterus out to the iliac vessels all in one slice with the probe. And so if I move the probe up and down on the patient, I've got a better chance of finding that ovary. Sometimes you've got to tilt your probe out to get a little bit more laterally and then move up and down. Whereas when I'm in a longitudinal cut, it's kind of like a laser beam and you've got to kind of just find the ovary and hope that you get in the pathway. So if I start with my probe here with a longitudinal cut, you know, it's only going to intersect with the ovary very briefly as you uh, find your way through and you don't necessarily have that landmark of the uterus beside it and the ovary in the same picture. So these ovaries are quite challenging. Um, the bladder is great, it helps us transmit the sound and the, fluid, the sound goes through the fluid really nicely but it also presents some challenges as well. So bladder is really prone to getting an edge artifact. So the sound comes down, hits the bladder wall and then bounces off to the side. And so then we get this black area of dropout. Um, and invariably that's right exactly above the ovary that we want to scan. And we've also got the challenges of bowel loops and they've got reverberation artifact. So there's lots going on that means that this is a little bit hard to get pictures. So when we pop the probe on, if we sli just slide over to the ovary, so go from the midline and position ourselves by sliding over to the left or to the right, this is the left side of the patient in this instance, you're going to get yourself right in front of that reverberation or that edge refraction artifact so that we obscure the view of the ovary. And here's an example. We can see on this example under the translucent dot there, the, the ovary is obscured by the edge of the uh, bladder there. So what we need to do is to slide to the opposite side of the patient and then rock the probe back in the direction you've just come and then tilt or fan the probe up and down the pelvis to see the whole area of their adnexa. So if I can represent that graphically, if the edge artifact is over here, if we slide over that way, and then we, that doesn't work. So we come in the other way, slide over, and then rock back to where we came from. And now we can see through the bladder. What we're trying to do is put the bladder in front of the ovary rather than the artifact. So by changing our window or changing our position on the patient, we get better visualization of the ovary. If we're doing that for the right ovary, I tend to, my first port of call for getting the ovaries is to slide to the opposite side of the patient and then rocking my probe back to the side that I want to scan to visualize the ovary. Every now and then you strike it lucky, you don't have bowel in the road or the bladder might be um, slightly displaced and not necessarily sitting in the midline or your patient might be really, really thin. Um, so my sort of second or my backstop call, if, if that first method doesn't work, the next thing I do is um, try by just sliding over, just sliding to the side of the ovary and every now and then you get lucky and you can visualize it. Here's an example where I've slid over and rocked back and you can see the ovary more clearly. So looking at the left, we're slide, uh, right over here sliding to the left and then fanning up and down and for the left ovary slide to the right side of the patient rock back and then fan up and down to see the ovary just in this area here just here 
Now, if I'm scanning longitudinal, um, it's a little bit, because the slice is very thin in the long plane, it's, it's a little bit hit and miss. So, but I still use the same principle. I slide over to the other side of the other side, opposite to where I want to be scanning, and then I tilt my probe back to the side I want to look at. Here's an example sweeping through the uterus. We have the right ovary, uterus, and the left ovary. Just let that clip run again. So the last sort of tip two is that bowel gas presents a problem, but if you give it a bit of a push and try to compress it, sometimes you get lucky in being able to squish, squish that bowel gas along to the next loop so that it uh, gives you a little bit freer space to be able to see the ovary that you need. So ovaries are tricky. We've got lots of different challenges and we're just trying to find the perfect window, but we've got to contend with bowel, we've got bladder artifact, we've got all sorts of things that are competing against us. And that's why it makes it quite tricky to see these, but you need to be practicing a lot and on every single pelvis patient so that you get good at seeing the ovaries before you can start to identify things like a ectopic pregnancy or an adnexal mass. If you're not used to looking for them, all the time and finding them on normal, easy, young, um, fertile women, it's much easier. Um, if you don't look for them all the time, you don't develop the skills. So you can't just pull this trick out when you absolutely need it. You have to have been practicing all the time. So does anyone have any questions on how to find the ovaries or comments? So Anne, will you be talking about uh, using a color Doppler to assess for ischemia or, or torsion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Coming soon. Do you know if there's many practitioners, point, point of care, emergency doctors in particular that are, are doing a lot of transabdominal ovary assessments? I don't know because I'm not a point of care physician, but yeah, okay. um, we teach it. We teach it to everyone. Yep. It's, it's, it's difficult because like if you've got ectopic pregnancy, for example, if you're trying to pull out, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look and I'm gonna visualize this on um, transabdominal ultrasound, you, you're not likely to be able to do that when the chips are down and when things are, and you've got a rush and all the rest of it. So we always teach it as part of a systematic survey of the pelvis, how much it goes on and do it. I suspect it's probably not, not a lot because you know, it's hard to get a good view. And unless you're practicing it all the time, you're just not gonna get a good view. And then people lose their confidence. So it seems like it's a waste of time. And ultimately, I guess, if you do really need to see the ovaries, you're gonna to need to have a transvaginal exam. And I'm not, I'm not sure that there's too many emergency departments, in Australia at least, that have um, transvaginal probes. And part of the problem for that is the whole cleaning and disinfection um, protocol. Certainly in the States, I know that um, the emergency docs need transvaginal skills and it's equally as much as the transabdominal. So they'll do either or as part of their normal um, procedure. Yeah, I was just going to say that, uh, Sue Ann. Uh, you've been to Castle Fest. I've been there as well recently. I mean, it's certainly within the skill set of an emergency doc to use a TV probe um, with some barrier um, uh, method over the probe um, but and then the trophon unit or something like that to clean it afterwards so uh, I, I don't do it where, where I'm at at the moment it comes down the, to equipment. I think in Australia um, it's not so much a lack of well maybe it is a lack of desire but I think the the limiting factor is just the whole disinfection protocol afterwards you know, do you get a trophon? Well, they're twelve or something thousand dollars. I'm not sure. I could be overstating it. I could be understating it. Um, One just appeared in RED two weeks ago, so I'm going to run with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's the Germy Tech thing, which is a UV 90 second sort of um, UV light thing that disinfects, or the Tristel wipes that you can use. But you know, you have to have someone who's actually going to clean the probe. Um, I think I think more in Australia. There's a hesitation because it's a much more invasive scan. Um, there's a hesitation, especially Victoria, the 
you know, their patients funnel to specific hospitals. Trauma goes to one lot and the, and the OBS and gynae stuff tends to go to another hospital. And if it's needing a proper OBS and gynae or if it needs a transvaginal scan, the OBS and gynae regions are around. So the ED docs just don't get the skills. You know what I found is, um, you know, when you're spending all your time learning the nuances of a, a transthoracic echo, and then somebody gives you um, a transesophageal probe for the first time, and you literally put it down, and everything clears up, and it's the most straightforward. Say the first, say a basic view. Well, it's kind of similar for uh, for TV for endocavitary. Like it's obvious when you put the probe in. Once you get to that point, the structures just become so much more obvious once you orientate your mind. Yeah, absolutely. The orientate your mind is is probably the biggest challenge of transvaginal scanning, to be honest, because the picture's all upside down and round about. So, all right. Well, we might push on with some ovarian torsion. I've got to get just the right spot to. Yeah. This one. All right, so have you got have you got an orange screen in front of you now? Excellent. All right, so ovarian torsion. The question was how do I how do I assess the pelvis for an ovarian torsion? So obviously ovarian torsion is where the ovary twists on the ligaments that hold it in place. And that twisting cuts off the blood supply to the ovary and the fallopian tube. It can be intermittent or sustained, and it results in venous and arterial and lymphatic stasis. So according to the American Pediatric Surgical Association, this is the fifth most common surgery of female reproductive organs. If it's not diagnosed early, there's a risk of tissue necrosis, and so the rush is on to preserve ovarian function. It's much more common in the 20 to 40 age group. And ultrasound, in particular transvaginal ultrasound, is the diagnostic modality of choice for detecting torsion. So why does the ovary tort or twist on itself? The biggest risk is that there's an adnexal mass, whether that be a cyst or a bad mass or whether that's anything that makes the ovary big and heavy. So particularly masses or cysts that are bigger than five to 10 centimeters in size, they're the ones that are most at risk of causing torsion of the ovary because the weight of the ovary or the mass causes it to twist on and rotate on those supporting ligaments. Corpus luteums of pregnancy can also cause the ovary to tort. Sometimes they can be a bit larger and so you've got the weight issue but often to the higher hormone levels, relax tissues in the body and make those ligaments more prone to twisting. And the other group that's at risk of torsion is the assisted reproductive technology ladies who undergo IVF and they've had ovulation induction. So you've got lots of follicles depending on how, how um, successful the drugs have been. And again, you get an increased weight on the ovary and a propensity for it to turn on itself. So if we look at the ovarian ligaments, laterally, you have the suspensory ligament and from the uterus to the ovary, we have the round ligament. And they're the two that sort of keep the ovary in place. It's the ovaries are pretty mobile structures, but these two ligaments kind of keep it in place and keep it behaving. And so when it twists and turns, um, it, it's literally like tying it in a knot and there's no wonder that the blood supply gets cut off. Now the blood supply to the ovary comes from two sources. We've got the ovarian artery coming from directly from the aorta and then off the, as a branch of the common iliac artery, we've got the uterine artery. So the blood supply of the ovary is actually from, and the um, adnexa there is actually from two different arteries. So the Doppler findings can be a little bit unreliable because you have to obstruct both the ovarian and the uterine arteries to demonstrate that there's no blood supply to the ovary. So it can be partially twisted and knock off one vessel and not the other, but still be quite painful and, and have damage to it. 
So if we look at what the ultrasound findings are, the most common ultrasound finding is an enlarged ovary bigger than four centimetres in size. You can also see variability in the echogenicity, and in particular, the central stroma is a little bit more hypoechoic. And quite commonly, in over 80% of cases, there's free fluid associated with it. So even on B mode, these sorts of findings have to raise your level of suspicion. The other things to think about, if there is an adnexal mass, if you do see a mass, whether it be cyst or like a dermoid or a, or a neoplasm, those, those larger masses are more likely to uh, make the ovary taut. We can also uh, correlate our probe pressure to where the actual position of the ovary is and so can elicit a much more accurate response. Is it probe tender or not? Or is it because of something else in the general vicinity? So the Doppler findings, Doppler findings in, torsions are, in torsion of the ovary are widely variable. Um, sometimes you can have little or no ovarian vein flow. This is quite common and it has a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 97%. Absent arterial flow is a less common sign, but it is a sign of poor prognosis for the ovary. You can get absent or reverse diastolic flow and, and typically this means that there's an increased resistance to the flow, whether it be because there's a stricture or because it's twisted on itself, but um, you lose the uh, diastolic flow. Just because you have normal vasculature, it doesn't rule out that there's intermittent torsion. So normal Doppler flow can occasionally be found because of that dual blood supply by the ovarian and uterine arteries. And, and some studies sort of also suggest about that you might see a whirlpool whirlpool sign of a twisted pedicle. I think in my clinical practice, I have seen in over 20 years or so, I have seen um, two cases and the B mode um, findings were way more obvious than the um, Doppler findings in those cases. They were big ovaries, they were swollen, the echo texture just didn't look right. I think the important point to make about ovarian torsion is you have to have practiced how to get the ovaries and know what normal ovaries look like. If you're not confident in your ability to find the ovaries and assess a normal ovary, which is quite difficult transabdominally, then how do you know what a torted ovary looks like? Or how do you know what abnormal um, stroma echogenicity looks like if you don't know what a normal one looks like? If you don't practice the ovaries and every time put colour on them on all the normal cases that you do, you don't build up that baseline of, of knowing that, well, it, there's not a whole lot of flow in the ovaries anyway. So that's what happens in most cases. And this one, you know, if, you, if you're practicing often and you put the colour Doppler on every single time, then you start to get a benchmark for what normal flow looks like. And the other key thing about this is that you have to have a good working understanding of uh, colour Doppler to be able to make use of it. If you don't know how to optimise the colour Doppler and how to use it properly, then you are increasing your chances of making a missed call. As I said right at the beginning, most of the time this is a transvaginal diagnosis. So if it's transabdominal, it's more a case of recognising the B mode characteristics. So let's look at some pictures. On this image here of the right ovary, and my images today are courtesy of Radiopedia. He has lots of lovely, lovely cases on there. Um, it's a good place for you to go to to do image review if you didn't know about it. Um, so here we've got a right ovary and it's a dermoid, dermoid cyst. So you can see this round cystic structure with some internal echoes. And on the right hand side picture, you can see some um, uh, that kind of echogenic area here, just to the right of my dot there, that um, is, is part of the dermoid. It might be, I don't know, a bit of fat or some calcification or whatever. So you can see that this ovary is quite enlarged. Just here we can see that um, mixed echogenicity area consistent with the dermoid. Here's an example where we've got different echo texture. So it's always really important to be able to try to see both so that you can compare the normal side and the abnormal side. And so what we're looking for 
is discrepancies in size, discrepancies in echo texture, and discrepancies in the blood flow. So in this case, we can see the right ovary is substantially larger than the left ovary. Um, you can see that the right ovary is a little bit more echogenic than the left ovary. And the power Doppler um, there shows flow within the stroma of the left ovary, but we don't really see too much in that right ovary. Power Doppler is a great tool for being able to demonstrate low flow. So Power Doppler displays the strength of the Doppler signal in colour, rather than giving any speed and directional information. And it's three times as sensitive than conventional colour for detecting flow. So it becomes particularly useful in, in areas of the body where there is um, low flow and low flow velocities. Here we've got another case with using the power Doppler. So the left image there shows an enlarged ovary. The middle picture, we can see some blood flow within the stroma of the ovary, but we have a very turbulent, we've got very turbulent flow on the spectral trace there and high velocity flow as well. And then if we look at the image on the other side, you start to see where you can see that um, color flow. Now, the interesting thing here is that not all point of care ultrasound machines have power Doppler on them. And you may not have used it before, I'm not sure. Um, certainly the handheld machines don't have power Doppler at all. So when you don't have all those fancy tools at your disposal, you sort of increase the odds that you're not going to be able to see it very well. Here's a case where um, a lady with ovulation induction, that ovary is 16 centimetres. So that, the size of that alone is enough to cause concern. But when we compare it with the other side, which is also quite a big ovary, it's, it's had uh, lots of hormone treatment, it, but uh, it's still quite a big ovary. Um, but when you compare each side, there's a very big difference in the size of those ovaries. When we look at... Uh, this case, you can see the right ovary looks pretty normal. You can see a few follicles on it, pretty normal size. And then the left ovary is markedly bigger. And on that left side, you can see a little bit of free fluid as well. And the, the echo texture of that left ovary is quite different. So because there's um, lots of swelling that happens, you've got increased fluid within the tissues and lots and lots more interfaces, which, what, which is what makes it um, a lot brighter. Here's another case. The right ovary has got some follicles on it, but on that right side, we can see some free fluid, um, which helps us to see that ovary quite nicely. But then the left side is um, quite a big ovary, increased echogenicity again, and, and you don't see the follicles so much. And you can see a lot more free fluid in that far right-hand picture there. So just a word of caution. Um, as always, I pulled out the trusty Lumifier to get some normal images specifically for this talk. And I had to rope in and go a bit further afield for my volunteers this time. Um, the, the, my patient for normal was completely normal, absolutely no pain whatsoever. And I was popping the colour on and I had it on a low flow setting. So you can see um, the flow settings here. The lower the number is, the, the better the sensitivity for low velocity flow. And so it's on the lowest possible setting. But you can see on this right ovary, I've absolutely no colour Doppler signal at all. And on the left there is a little bit medially, maybe that's flow in the um, uterine artery portion. But, um, you know, there's nothing really in the stroma. And on this particular machine, I haven't got the ability to adjust the um, flow sensitivity. I get the choice between low and high, and there's no power Doppler settings either. So this patient is completely normal with absolutely no pain. But if we were just to go by uh, the color Doppler flow settings here, it would be saying maybe she's got a torted ovary and it just doesn't match the clinical picture. So it's a big word of caution. You have to know your machine well and know how to use it um, before you can rely, rely on it to be able to definitely say on the, on the Doppler findings that it's a torted ovary. Another picture here, 
We've got some flow at the edge of the vessels, at the edge of the ovary, and a little bit right on the edge of that left one. So the question was, how do I assess ovarian torsion? Compare both ovaries, look at the size. You'll often find a discrepancy in the size and torted ovaries tend to be bigger, more than four centimetres. Look at the echogenicity of both ovaries. Um, the torted ovary can be brighter or it can be quite hypoechoic, it depends when you catch it. Check and see if there's any free fluid. And you'll notice these are all B-mode signs to, to evaluate the um, ovary. I think it's a case of look at as many pictures as you can so that you pattern recognize what a torted ovary looks like um, more than sort of relying on the color. You can pop the flow on, but if the, if the first time you put your color flow on and you want to get a definitive answer is the case that has a torted ovary, you can't really be confident that is it no flow or is it because your settings are not the best. So does anyone have any questions? on torsion of the ovaries. Well, Suanne, I think you've inspired me. Uh, I've always had this uh, ap application of point of care ultrasound in the too hard basket, to be honest with you. Um, it, it's ironic because uh, I often find a lot of point of care doctors, I teach a lot of emergency doctors and, and um, they always put testicular exams, for example, uh, testicular torsion in the too hard basket, which I find rather odd because geez, they're pretty easy to find. There's no air in the way. There's no bone in the way. Uh, you got a control side and it's, it's rather easy. So hopefully people will, will pick up on, on the ovaries too. Yeah, the, the testicles are another one that um, it does come down to knowing how to use the color. You can have your color sensitivity set wrong or have the gain set wrong and you could miss a torted testicle. They, it has def definite B-mode appearances that you look for, but you could miss it based on the color flow settings just because you haven't got them set correctly. So again, you don't want to just pull, pull out the color and expect it to work on the case where you really need it. You need to have practiced it and refined the art of the image optimization along the way before you can rely on it in, in a um, case where you need it. Uh, Sue Ann, when I was learning some gallbladder ultrasound, I never realized how tricky it was, but it makes all the rest of the abdominal organs seem um, easier by comparison. So I'm glad I started with the more difficult one. And I would imagine ovaries is quite tricky as well. Testicles would be um, straightforward by comparison. Testicles are, um, like you say, Brian, there's, there's nothing in the road and you've got a nice linear probe and it's straight on and um, nothing much to obstruct visualization. The ovaries are much more difficult, but, um, and even color flow on the testes, it's much more simple to get a good color flow trace than it is on ovaries because you have to get a good window before you can actually apply the Doppler and that's half the battle. Yeah, and uh, I also find that the, the point of care machines often struggle with the color at depth, and I'm sure you, you, you've seen it yourself. Absolutely. Depend, it, look, some of, some of the various systems are surprisingly sensitive. Um, I've, I have overheard a sonographer um, colleague sort of say, oh, no, those machines can't see some of this stuff at all or even see a baby. And, you know, the, the higher-end point of care systems are, you know, way better than what I started practicing on in, as a high-end system back in the dark ages. Um, but, you know, the, the technology is improving. The handhelds will probably will always struggle with colour Doppler. That's not what they're really designed for. Um, but a lot of the point of care systems, it is getting up there, but they don't necessarily have power Doppler. And so, you know, in this case, that's, that would be the best tool to use. Any other questions or comments? Turn this off. Doesn't want to advance on me again. There we go. Right. Can you see my screen again now? Nope. All right. 
Have you got a green screen in front of you? Excellent. All right, Ken, here you go. <laughs> um, the Idiot's Guide to Spectral Doppler. This one has particularly troubled me all week. Um, so I started with what a definition of a dummy or an idiot's guide is, and they say that it's a how-to reference intended to present a non-intimidating guide on a complex topic. I thought that's interesting because spectral Doppler is indeed a very complex topic. An idiot in the title here is used as a hyperbole in claiming an ensured understanding. Now I have about 20 minutes or so left and I'm not going to claim that you're going to have an ensured understanding at the end of this. Making Doppler simple is actually really complex. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to do and certainly I remember as a sonography student, I started practice at the Prince Charles Hospital, which was, uh, which predominantly had a lot of carotids and, you know, the echoes went to a different part, but um, there was lots and lots more Doppler in my first six months. And I sat there and it was very good at putting me to sleep most days. Um, the whoosh sound was very relaxing. Um, I watched for ages and ages and I just didn't get it for a long, long time. They would explain it over and over to me now that might say something about me, but I also think that it is a uh, tricky topic. The thing with spectral Doppler though, is if you're not using it properly, you may as well not use it at all because you can get yourself into some real trouble. The other question that I kind of, I was trying to think, what, what do you use spectral Doppler for in the ED and, and how do you use it? And, and it kind of um, came that, Oh, my slides aren't advancing again. There we go. There's diminishing returns clinically on the investment of time it takes to be able to use it properly. So my first reaction to this question was, you know, you want the idiot's guide. I just think, don't be an idiot. Don't use it. Um, but I realised that there are some advanced users out there who do want to start playing with this. Now, it might be a different kettle of fish in echo circles. There might be a whole lot of measurements that you can start to do much more easily in echo than in general. Um, but echo's not where my training is, so I'm not going to comment on those. Most of your questions in clinical practice can be answered with good B mode in the point of care setting. So you should spend the most amount of time developing those skills and how to get good pictures and how to get a good window, even if the patient's challenging, and how to interpret and integrate the findings. So it's a better, better, in my opinion, it's a better use of time to spend more time trying to get better pictures than it is learning pulse wave Doppler. There's some things in clinical practice where colour might provide you with a differential that might change your management. But again, you'll have a high level of suspicion for that particular differential based on your B mode findings. So by the time you get to the pulse wave or continuous wave Doppler or spectral Doppler question, as I said, there's a diminishing rate of return on the amount of time it takes to get across that content and to be able to use it well and to use it um, optimising your image well and making sure you're not making mistakes. So I wrecked my brain and consulted a few colleagues and kind of asked the question, well, what kind of exams? And here's not a definitive list, but uh, here's a list of topics I came up with that you might... Uh, definitely use colour on. So ovarian torsion, we've already talked about that, and testicular caution, torsion. Um, in lumps and bumps to determine, you know, you might have a false aneurysm or after an interventional procedure, um, you might want to pop the colour on to make sure that it is a uh, hematoma or an abscess rather than a nasty neoplasm of some description. It has happened. Um, you know, maybe determine the difference between an, an inflammatory lymph node or a nasty lymph node. In aneurysms, uh, seeing dissectional flaps, uh, it can help with your, your differential there. You might otherwise miss. Um, looking at the popliteal fossa and determining whether there's an arterial aneurysm or if indeed it is a Baker's cyst. Uh, if you have a cold limb and you don't know if there's any blood supply, popping the colour on to be able to help determine if there is any colour flow and any flow to the distal limb. 
in the heart, if you pop the colour on, you can certainly see big regurgitant jets uh, and, and it can be quite useful there. DVTs, umbilical arteries, uh, certainly in point of care settings, um, umbilical artery Doppler is good, but uh, most of the time the obs and gynies do that. I don't think the emergency physicians dabble into the third trimester. Most of the ones I know are allergic to first trimester. So um, now the other place, when I did a bit of a Google search and I just popped into Google, you know, spectral Doppler in the ED, I think the whole first page, probably 80% of the results was transcranial Doppler. Um, and I know I've been to a one day workshop in the States where we were looking at it and my take home was, oh my God, that's confusing and really, really hard. And I don't even know where to start, but um, I know that it is possible to be evaluating strokes and also uh, the brain swelling by looking at transcranial Doppler and that they can, particularly like ICU and stuff in some of the um, wards in the States are using transcranial Doppler to sort of help determine when they're going to intervene with medication to, to bring brain swelling down and, and to optimise that treatment. I'm not, I'm not really aware of anyone, which doesn't mean it's not happening, but I'm not really aware of anyone um, being able to, doing that very much in Australia. And the last place I thought was maybe bowel for ischemic bowel or inflammatory bowel, but again, that's a high level question as well. And then when I really did put my uh, thinking cap on to try to determine, you know, well, what would you use spectral Doppler for cl clinically? Perhaps you have a cold limb and you're just going to pop the trace on to listen to see if that black dot you can see is arterial or vein and, um, and in DVTs to determine if, again, if it's artery or vein that you're looking at or if there's any flow augmentation perhaps in cardiac that there's more application for spectral Doppler, but again, that's, that's a sort of level three um, cardiac exam, not your exam that you need to do on everyone in the ED. So having said all that, you asked the question, so I'm gonna cover some of the principles and try to put a bit of context or, or you know, what what some of those um, different Dopplers are and, and go through some of the basics. So the Doppler effect, um, everyone's heard this. When the ambulance is coming towards you, you hear the sirens get louder. And when the ambulance is moving away from you, it seems like the sirens are getting quieter. The ambulance, the paramedic is not um, sitting there on the volume budding and turning it up and down. Um, what we actually hear is a frequency shift. So as the ambulance comes towards us, the sound waves are squishing up. And as this, the ambulance moves away or the police car, the sound waves are stretching out. And so the Doppler equation means, or, the, or that phenomenon is known as the Doppler effect. And you can put that frequency shift into an equation and solve for things like what the speed of um, the blood flow is and things like that. So the common um, ones that we know where the Doppler effect is used is colour Doppler. And in colour Doppler, it's a method for visually detecting motion or blood flow. And you use a colour map that's sort of superimposed over the V-mode image. This gives you directional flow. And unfortunately, the colours are red and blue, and that doesn't mean artery and vein. It means to uh, flow towards the probe or away from the probe. The power Doppler displays the strength of the Doppler signal in color rather than the speed and direction information. And as I said before, it has about three times the sensitivity of conventional color Doppler for detecting flow and is particularly useful for small vessels or those with low velocity flow. So when we look at the color Doppler, um, we can see the flow direction. It's important to understand that the colour depicted within the vessels indicates either flow towards or away from the probe. Um, the way to remember it is BART, blue away, red towards. On this picture here, you can see this colour scale on the side. So the red flow is towards or in the positive direction and blue is away. The flow in the middle, black or dark red, is a very low velocity flow. And as the colour gets brighter, it's much more high velocity flow. And the same in the reverse channel. Now, because we're using pulsed 
wave Doppler, um, you, you have colour aliasing or you reach the Nyquist limit. So if we had a vessel, for example, and we had set our sensitivity to 40 centimetres per second, and it was in fact 100 um, centimetres per second, what happens is the sampling rate is too fast for what the velocity is. And so what the machine does is it uses up all of this. So you get color in the red and orange and yellow, and then it uses some from the reverse channel. And so you get green and blue flow as well to indicate that high velocity flow. So you can have a vessel that is as depicted here this flow doesn't sort of change direction halfway. We've got blood flow going towards the crystals indicated by the red and blood flow moving away indicated by the blue. So it's not changing direction halfway through, but it, the, the color is dependent on which way the crystal or where the crystals are. On color Doppler with really good settings, you can see very quickly areas of restricted or no flow. And again, so the, the, the hue or the colour there and how bright the colour is indicates um, turbulence or the speed of the uh, blood flow. The thing with spectral Doppler is that you need to have a good colour image first before you can succeed with the, with the spectral Doppler trace. The colour image needs to be optimised and doing a good job first because then we can see where the areas are of restriction here really easy and then that guides us to where we place our um, sample volume and, and make the measurements. So here's that um, principle of aliasing again. You can see the picture on the right here, um, the blood flow or the colour flow there is all in a very similar colour, so it's laminar flow. Here we have one um, and all that's wrong in this position, if you look here, the, the, on the right hand picture the scale is set at 24 and on the left hand picture it's set at 6. So you can artificially induce here um, the uh, turbulent flow or really high velocity flow when in fact what's happening is that your settings are wrong. And so your sampling is faster than what you can actually um, represent the speed. So you get that wrapping around of the um, colour and colour aliasing. Now the spectral Doppler, we've got pulse wave Doppler. And pulse wave Doppler sends short pulses of ultrasound and analyzes the reflected sound waves between the pulses. By sending the short and quick pulses of sound, it becomes possible to accurately measure the velocity of blood in a precise location and in real time. Pulse, Doppler, pulse wave Doppler also is, um, has signal aliasing at high frequencies, but it's good for um, determining exactly what depth that those high frequencies were coming from. Continuous wave Doppler utilizes continuous transmission and reception of the ultrasound waves. And that's accomplished by using two dedicated transducer elements. One is to send and one is to receive. Because there's no pulses emitted, it, does, it doesn't permit us to determine where the wave is. So pulse wave Doppler, you send and by the, uh, you wait for it to return. And by knowing how long it's taken to return, you can accurately tell the depth. Whereas in continuous wave Doppler, because you're constantly sending and receiving at the same time, you don't get uh, the depth information. Continuous wave Doppler though, um, doesn't have signal aliasing. So it's fantastic for showing really high velocity flow. And, and typically uh, the only place you find this is in the echo settings. And if you're doing a lot of echo and on the uh, phased array probe, uh, and that's because the, you know, the velocities that you get across the valves, particularly when there's stenosis and other stuff going on, um, the velocities are much higher. So you need the ability to demonstrate those much higher velocities. So the advantage of the pulse wave Doppler, you can see in this picture here, um, you put your Doppler line in and you can see the two horizontal lines here, which indicate the sample volume. And that sort of specifies where along the Doppler line to, that the machine needs to measure the velocities. So because it's either sending or receiving, the, the machine's programmed to ignore all those signals except for those that are at the sample volume depth because it knows where that sample volume is. It knows how long it takes to get there because the speed of sound is constant in human tissue. So it just ignores everything else and gives you the information from within the sample volume. So the operator can specify where the measurement's taken by moving that sample volume. And you need to know the interrogation angle and the speed of sound so that 
the Doppler equation can be solved for the velocity. So if we look at the Doppler equation, the, you, you know what the transmit frequency is of the probe, and then you're waiting to hear the uh, receive frequency. You know that this C is the speed of sound in tissue, which is constant. And when we're doing spectral Doppler, we also know what the theta angle is or the Doppler angle is. So that means we can solve this equation and get velocities. The most important component of the equation is the angle um, and the cos of theta. So if the cos of, if we've got an angle of zero, the cos of zero is one. So when you've got a zero angle, you've got maximum accuracy. But if we are perpendicular to the direction of blood flow, the cos of 90 degrees is zero. So if we put zero into the cos theta here, that resolves the whole equation for zero all the time. So when we're at a, at a perpendicular angle to the probe, uh, to the uh, blood vessel, you don't get any um, Doppler um, trace coming back. But that, that Doppler angle is really crucial in, in this whole thing. And, and that's where things can turn to custard pretty quickly. I'll just go here. If we use an angle greater than 60 degrees, we'll introduce too large an error into the velocity calculation. So the image on the left here um, is an image of the carotid artery with the angle parallel with the blood flow. The angle between the marker and the ultrasound is less than 60 degrees. On the right, the angle and the ultrasound beam is closer to 90. Um, and so consequently, the calculated velocity on the common carotid artery on the, on the right is only about 15 centimetres per second. So the poor, the poor angle in this one has led to an underestimation of the velocity. So in the clinical situation, the way that could manifest is that you assume that there's a stenosis or a, a very severe stenosis and not enough flow there, um, rather than something that might be mild. And, and that's all because you haven't lined up your angles properly. Power, uh, pulse wave Doppler can also experience the aliasing phenomenon because uh, if, you, know, you reach the Nyquist limit, if you exceed the sample rate, the, the trace will wrap around and um, represent itself on the on the negative side of the line. So if we if we if we bring the baseline down and then increase the um, pulse repetition frequency like we have in, in the B example here, then you can see the trace much more clearly. In continuous wave Doppler, the advantage is that you can display those really high velocities um, because the Nyquist limit doesn't apply. You've got constant send and receive, but we don't know where along that sample line or that where, that, where the fastest velocity has come from. So if we look at the spectral Doppler waveforms, the spectral Doppler permits a graphic display of the velocities over time. So the Doppler trace has a Y axis, which represents the velocity, and an X axis, which shows the time. Velocities towards the transducer are depicted above the line or on the positive axis, and velocities away from the transducer or below the zero line uh, uh, represented underneath the line. The advantage of pulse wave Doppler 2 is that the signals are converted to audio signals. So it, it lets the investigator or the operator hear the blood flow. So you can, you can hear the difference. I'm sure when you're listening to valves, I know when I listened to Mike's valve, it sounded like a really dodgy Doppler trace. So, you know, really clean signal, you get that whoosh, whoosh sound. And when you've got um, really high velocities, it kind of goes psss, really high pitched um, sound. So the spectral Doppler gives information about the velocity of the blood over time. In this example here, you can see an arterial waveform versus a venous waveform. So on the left, we have an arterial waveform. Because it, the, the spectral Doppler will let you measure the maximum um, velocities and also the machine can calculate a mean velocity over time. The maximum velocity is the highest point that it gets to above the line. The mean velocity is calculated by the machine and these Doppler curves can also give you information about the timing of events. So especially when you're relating things to the ECG tracing. For example, you can measure time intervals such as the ejection period or 
the relaxation time or diastolic filling time. Just by, or, or you can look at the slope of the curve and, and look at the acceleration and deceleration um, times. I'm sure that stuff is all much more interesting and useful in ECHO, but in general terms, we, we don't actually use those things too much. Also, the velocities you can, uh, using Bernoulli's equation, you can start to relate velocities to pressure, and that becomes a useful tool in the echo, in the echo world as well. So you can see this arterial pulse versus a much more lower velocity, not so defined um, venous trace and venous waveform here. So those, just by not even looking at the velocities, but just looking at the shapes of the waveform, you can, you can get some information from them. So the, the various arteries have um, typical characteristic waveforms. And if we look here at the umbilical artery, the A example at the top here is really nice blood flow in the umbilical artery. So what we can see here is forward blood flow in all parts of the cardiac cycle. So when you have a bub that's growing strong and a bit like a parasite, it needs to get all the blood it can and grow really strong. It, um, it needs a lot of blood supply to do that. And so we want to always see flow through all parts of the cycle. In the example B here, we have absent blood flow in diastole. So it gets blood flow for half the cycle, but just nothing in diastole. So this would indicate to an obstetrician gynecologist that this bub was in trouble and that they needed to monitor the baby. And as the resistance to flow, whether that be because the vascular bed in the placenta is not going well or because it's the umbilical artery is twisted on itself, you might get reversed diastolic flow. So this means you've got the seesaw action forward and reverse flow in the umbilical artery. Now, if you think of that hungry baby that needs to grow at all expense, um, not having blood supply to the brain for half the time is not, not, so, um, not so good. So if we saw a trace like that, even without measuring any velocities, because we don't need to worry with the umbilical artery, we know that bub's in trouble and it's a case of um, deliver baby today. The venous waveforms, depending on where they are, have characteristic flow as well and characteristic patterns. So you can see the portal vein trace here. If you think of the portal vein, it kind of acts a bit like an artery insofar as it's, it's the major blood supply to the liver draining, draining the uh, bowel and supplying a lot of the blood to the liver for um, filtration, etc. And so it's a big blood vessel and it has forward flow, uh, forward flow in the vein at all times. Whereas we look at the, the femoral vessel, legs are more expendable than livers apparently, but it has, um, it has forward, uh, you know, that seesaw forward and backwards motion. And that's because as the, as the blood vessels get smaller, there's more resistance to blood flow as, as well. The other thing that you can tell with a spectral Doppler trace uh, is looking at whether the flow is laminar or whether it's turbulent. So when you get strictures or, um, or you know, plaque or, you know, if you've twisted a knot in the ovarian artery or whatever, it causes the flow to be quite turbulent after the, after the stricture. And so on the colour, you see that laminar flow is all as a single colour together. And you can see on the example here on the right, where you've got some um, turbulent blood flow just at the junction of the ICA there. On the spectral trace, the laminar flow, you've got all the blood vessels traveling at a similar speed. And so you've got a very thin line of um, signals here and a very clear envelope underneath because the blood all moves at the same sort of speed. Whereas when you have turbulent blood flow, you can see that underneath that window or that envelope or spectral curve there is all filled in. So this, this trace here is showing me that there's lots of different um, velocities of the blood flow and quite turbulent blood flow. So I reckon that's enough physics, physics -y stuff for one night. I, I didn't know how far to go. I kind of thought we'll cover some of the basic concepts of the Doppler. Um, if you, if one point you take home is the spectral Doppler, you have to get your angles right and without the angles being um, right, you're a bit buggered. The, and the Doppler angles is not only reliant on setting the, um, 
the Doppler gates and the, and the sample volume and the thing on the actual machine, but you can adjust the Doppler angles just by adjusting your probe position on the patient as well. Um, and the other take home was that there are characteristic waveforms with relation to the different arteries and veins, but also the different arteries and the different veins within themselves can have characteristic waveforms. I thought that if we, like I covered some of the basic principles, but if you had a particular clinical question that you were hoping to use spectral Doppler for, it might make it a little bit easier to um, focus on the pros and cons of that particular use of spectral Doppler. Um, it's a bit hard to conquer everything about spectral Doppler in, in 20 minutes. So, uh, you know, we've covered the basic stuff. I think the image optimization is a whole topic all on its own. Uh, I hope that the big message you take home is beware, it's not easy. Um, this was the idiot's guide. My suggestion is don't be an idiot, just don't do it. So <laughs> um, has anyone, I think cardiac, maybe it's more useful, but for general stuff, it's probably borderline out of scope, I think, for point of care. I don't know, does anyone have any strong feelings or thoughts or disagree or agree with that? Ian. Thanks, Sue Anne. That was, that was really useful. Um, I suppose it just kind of introduced the concepts. And I think what you said, and Daniela uh, emphasized that as well, be mode, getting your best image as possible in B mode. And it kind of comes back to what you say and what other groups say as well. So acquire the images, optimize the images, and then plug in the clinical integration. Um, I think it probably is more useful in cardiac um, because it's just, there's so much dependent on blood flow. And I think if we can get some good B mode images, especially when you explained like uh, ovarian tissue, I think you might not need it at all. Yeah. I think if we wanted to do specific cardiac spectral Doppler, I need to invite a guest along to talk to you about that. <laughs> but no, but great. I think you've covered like a really broad topic in a short space of time. And the main take home is be careful and be good at B. Be good at the B mode first. I think color is more useful and, and definitely, again, in our courses, we have at various times, we started off trying to teach um, color and spectral and it just went really, really badly because when you have a novice user, they're, they're focused so much on getting the view um, that they certainly can't keep the view still and hold the probe still enough for long enough while they adjust the buttons on the machine. And so we just found that it was, it was, it was really difficult and, and recognised very quickly that it's an advanced skill. Um, so we backed it off to be just doing colour and only kind of in the more advanced topics are we doing colour. Uh, because I think you have to be really confident at optimising your B mode image to get a good colour, optimising your colour image to be able to get good spectral traces. So, um, you know, the, the colour every now and then I think could help for an advanced user, but broadly B mode imaging is going to be the way to go and more effort spent on getting better windows and optimising your image is probably going to help you more than any of the other fancy stuff. Do you use colour for very much, Rebecca? Uh, ma mainly cardiac um, and definitely for renal, trying to work out um, hydronephrosis versus vessels. Um, and obviously for, you know, gallbladder, finding the common bile duct. Uh, so it, I, I think it is important um, and, and for DVT too, um, uh, to try and help work out what's going on. So you do need to uh, think, I think, be taught it early uh, so that you can gradually develop um, those skills over time. I think, I think all those examples that you used, again, the colour is probably going to help. And I think the way you'd use spectral would be to be listening for the difference between artery and vein. Um, but the, you know, getting a spectral trace of um, 
you know, the hepatic artery or whatever, when you're looking for bile duct, you just don't do it. And there's no sort of normalized values that we commonly use for that sort of stuff. So um, I think color is achievable. Spectral is a little bit more challenging, but jury's out probably is way, way more useful in echocardiography, I think. Mm. And yeah. I th certainly for yeah, any you know, good valve study, then you need um, the spectral. My, my cardio what, what? skills extend to B mode imaging in a point of care setting. I can put a color, bo color box on, but uh, yeah, any of the quantitative stuff for, for cardiac and, and that's way beyond my training. <laughs> so, what are you going to say? One area, that, one area that you see popping up in the literature, especially in the last year, with some of the guys like Phil Rolla, they're intensivists, um, and uh, Corbin Haycock is the um, the vexus stuff, so looking for fluid shifts in dynamics and using spectral on uh, IVC, using spectral on hepatic vein and splenic vein and portal vein. So just see, uh, observing the waveforms that happen there. And, but that's what you had covered. You had mentioned that and you'd looked at the patterns and seeing if there's reversal of flow and how that ties in with full body ultrasound, cardiac lungs and the, the end organs as well. I don't understand it. I'm, I'm trying to get my head around it. It's interesting because even like um, as sonographers, uh, splenic and hepatic and looking for flow reversal um, in abdominal vessels, that's something that there, that's at the specialist centres that not all sonographers would be really skilled in that. Would you think that's fair to say, Daniela? Yeah, I'm going to say those who are doing livers mainly. Um, I mean, we do portal vein dopplers for, uh, you know, a spectral trace for looking for flow reversals fairly routine, but going any further than that, they're doing like a full-on liver study. So it's certainly not routine. Yeah. And and like a, a portal vein thrombosis or whatever, those cases come along so rarely. But again, it's about trying it on normals as much as you can so then the abnormal jumps out at you. Back to basics. That's what you and Bob Jarman have always said: normology versus abnormal. Yeah. So we might wrap it up very quickly. Um, I think I'm not even sure. It's probably getting a bit late. Um, the oh, it doesn't want to. So uh, topics on the card for next week was um, some tips and tricks on how to find the common bile duct. Um, and I'd like to um, try at you bringing some cases along, whether it be a case that is um, something that you've struggled with or it's a common technical thing that you're having trouble with or whether it's just even an, a really interesting case with some good pictures. Uh, if you wanted to send me either your questions or or your cases, or if you can't send your case, um, let me know that you've got a case that, uh, and then we can uh, use this wonderful technology to share screens and stuff. Um, I'd ask that you just make sure all your images are de-identified, but we've got some heavy hitting enthusiasts here. So if there's some cases that you want to bounce off each other for how you would deal with the clinical integration or whatever, it's an opportunity to sort of make make use of the community uh, in in looking at those um, cases. And before I sign off, I'm just going to acknowledge Philip's support again and uh, letting me play with the Lumify. It has been fun. It's a good little good little system. I still keep thinking, wow, you can get a whole lot. Um, but yeah, send me your questions either at the Twitter hashtag for Zenu now or at my personal one or email me. Um, and otherwise, We'll call it a night. Thanks, Suanne. That's okay. Thanks. Great to see everyone. It's good to see you all. Bye-bye.